Hello again everybody and for the penultimate time I'm going to be talking about uh, some things that interest me to do with the classical world, in particular to do with Homer. And I've been thinking a lot, uh, given that I'm near the end of all these things, uh, with uh, thinking about beginnings and endings. Now in Homer's Iliad he starts off with an invocation to the goddess. Uh, an invocation and a, and a prayer to sing, for, uh, to sing about the anger of Achilles and his feud with Agamemnon, lord of men, and how that brought untold anguish. At the end of the Iliad, Achilles and Agamemnon are still alive, though not for long as it turns out. But Patroclus and Hector, who in many ways are the most interesting and most heroic figures in uh, the poem, are both dead. Now this is how the Iliad ends. When early dawn appeared with her rosy fingers, then the people collected around the pyre of famous Hector. When they were all gathered together in one place, first they extinguished the pyre with gleaming wine, all of it that the fire's fury had reached. And then his brothers and companions gathered the white bones, mourning, and heavy tears fell from their cheeks. And they took the bones and put them in a golden box, wrapping them in soft purple cloths, and they quickly placed it in the hollow of a grave and covered it over with great stones laid close together. Then they piled a grave mound over it in haste, with lookouts set on all sides in case the well-grieved Achaeans made an early attack. When they had piled the mound, they went back, and then they gathered again in due order and held a glorious feast in the house of Priam, the God-ordained king. Such was the burial they gave to Hector, tamer of horses. It's not a glorious victory. It's not a homecoming. It's not even about the Greeks. The greatest Greek poet ended the Iliad writing sympathetically about a Trojan killed and violated by a Greek. What an amazing thing that is. The Odyssey also begins with an invocation to the goddess, to the muse, to tell of the man of many ways, Polymertes Odysseus, and how he struggled to return home. We're not actually sure where the ending of the Odyssey is. As early as the 12th, 12th century, scholars have argued that it really ends at Book 23, line 296, not at the end of Book 24. And the reason, part of the reason they argue for that is that the Odyssey is about homecoming, about Nostos. And Book 23, 296, Odysseus has returned home. There is, however, another book and a bit uh, of additional material. Some people, some scholars have suggested that this is a kind of uh, continuation, an early fan fiction, if you like, more than uh, another book by Homer. So, the ending of the Odyssey is either this, but Odysseus and Penelope, after their love had taken its sweet course, turned to the fresh delights of talk and interchanged their news. He heard this noble wife tell of all she'd put up with in his home, watching the, that gang of wreckers at their work, of all the cattle and fat sheep that they'd slaughtered for her sake, of all the vessels they'd emptied of their wine. And in his return, royal Odysseus told her of all the discomfiture he'd un inflicted on his foes, and all the miseries which he himself had undergone. She listened spellbound, and her eyelids never closed in sleep, till the whole tale was finished. Now that phrase, till the whole tale was finished, would be a rather neat ending uh, for Homer to achieve, uh, for his own tale being finished at the same time as, uh, as Odysseus's story. The alternative ending, and this comes from the end of Book 24, goes like this. Odysseus has uh, had to go out and fight against uh, the relatives of the suitors who were pretty cross that he'd killed all their, uh, all their relatives. Athene's cry struck panic into the Ithacans, who let their weapons go in their terror at the goddess's voice. The arms all fell to earth and the men turned citywards intent on their own salvation. The indomitable Odysseus raised a terrible war cry, gathered himself together and pounced on them like a swooping eagle. But at this moment Zeus let a flaming bolt which fell in front of the bright-eyed daughter of that formidable sire. 
Athene called out at once to Odysseus by his royal titles, commanding him to hold his hand and bring this civil strife to a finish for fear of offending the ever-watchful Zeus. Odysseus obeyed her with a happy heart, and presently Pallas Athene, daughter of the Aegis-wearing Zeus, still using mentor's form and voice for her disguise, established peace between the two contending forces. Well, for a great poet like Odysseus, I think that's a bit of a, a weedy end, to be honest. Uh, and I, uh, while I used to incline to that as an end, I now very much incline to the former. Uh, the Odyssey is really all about nostos, that idea of return. And Book 23, 296 is exactly that. But considering the beginnings and ends of both the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, displays the great difference in the style, content and everything about each poem. The Iliad is the more massive, it's the more tragic, it's the more all-encompassing. And that choice of final scene is, I find, just breathtaking. The Odyssey is more modern, it's more approachable and it's more novel-like. Each have their moments of genius and between them it's fair to say that almost all of human life is there. To finish on a personal note about Homer, when my mother was very ill, uh, she was unable to hold a conversation and so I used to go read to her. And the last thing I ever said to her was to read from the Odyssey. And as she came into conscious, in and out of consciousness, uh, at one point, uh, pretty much the last thing she said to me was hearing the stories from Homer was just like meeting old friends. I hope that you will read the Odyssey and the Iliad, and I hope for you, the Iliad and the Odyssey will become your friends too.